So a very good evening to you all, uh, wherever you may be. Good evening, uh, good day, good morning. I know people were from different parts uh, of the world. It's good to be with you. Welcome to this dialogue uh, hosted here by the Jesuit Institute. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Russell Pollitt. I'm a Jesuit um, and I'm a director here of the uh, Jesuit Institute. To begin with, let's just take a moment, if you'd like to close your eyes, just to be still, to just become aware of how you feel at this moment as we enter into uh, this space and this conversation uh, this evening. Thank you. So it's good to have you with us, and I am very happy uh, to have, uh, it's a privilege really to have Father David Neuhaus with us. Uh, for those of you who don't know Father David, he is uh, in South Africa at the moment, um, but he is part of the Middle East province of the Society of Jesus, and he actually lives and works in Jerusalem. Uh, on the 7th of October, uh, David left South Africa to go back to Jerusalem, uh, to do some teaching there. He was meant to come back two weeks later. He got delayed because when he got uh, to uh, uh, Israel, as you all know, on the 7th of October, uh, this war started. That was the, the day when it all began. So this is a, a sensitive topic, one that's uh, been on news for the last six weeks. And we hear many different stories uh, from different sides, different media tell the story in different ways. And what we thought we need to do is just try to listen uh, without maybe the, the various biases of media, listen to uh, someone who has been there, who understands the context, uh, listen to what they have to say, so that somehow in all that we hear, we might be a little bit more clear and understand uh, what is going on uh, in uh, Israel and uh, especially in Gaza uh, at this time. So thank you very much, David, for agreeing uh, to talk uh, tonight on this uh, topic. And I would really like to begin by asking you, uh, recently you wrote an article in America Magazine, you also wrote one in the tablet, where you speak about the difficulty of finding ways to describe this pitiless war. You have friends, you wrote, on both sides uh, of uh, this war, and you've spent time with them. Tell us a little bit about your recent experience in Israel and Palestine as this unfolded. So I'm happy to be with you, Russell, and with everybody who's listening in. Yes, I arrived the day after the war began and spent much of the next weeks listening, listening, perhaps trying to be a shoulder. And I use that image with the idea that people came, Jewish Israelis, Palestinian Arabs, and many other people who live in the Holy Land to weep, to cry. I noticed when people would walk into the room that perhaps the only meaningful thing I could do at that moment was to give them a long hug and let them talk. And what of course poured out was a lot of pain, a lot of sadness, a lot of feeling lost and confused, but not only that, also a lot of rage a lot of desire for revenge. On the Israeli side, there seemed to be some who were in fact ashamed of what had happened in addition to the rage and the deep pain and sadness. There was a sense of shame. How could this have happened? We as Israelis are supposed to have the strongest army in the world. How did these people get through the border? And on both sides, the Palestinian side and the Jewish-Israeli side, 
of course, a lot of old trauma was reopened. Immediately the discourse became a discourse of remembering the worst persecutions the Jews had gone through in their history, the comparisons with what had happened during the Shoah, the Nazis, and on the Palestinian side, the memories of the Nakba, uh, the 1948 expulsion of the Palestinian people from their homes, as Israelis told them to leave their homes in the north of Gaza and go to the south. So really, it was a, it was a long time of listening. And then, of course, realizing how difficult it was to find words. Needless to say, most of the time, the people who were coming to see me did not want to hear my words. They wanted my ear, my shoulder, my embrace. But as people started to ask me, what's going on? What do you think about the situation? I realized that I had to put words on it. And there comes the challenge of saying the truth when we know that in a war, the truth is one of the first victims put to death by the propaganda machines on both sides that start to churn out a discourse that will legitimate whatever is being done and horror is being done. Hmm. David, you've already pointed to the, in the, in the beginning of the way you answered that question. I mean, some would have us believe, many, uh, if one looks at much of the secular media, that all this began on the 7th of October. Russell, you have muted yourself. Sorry, yeah. did, did you hear any of that? Yeah, that all began on the 7th of October. 7th of October. And yet, um, there's a long and painful history, uh, if one looks at the situation uh, in Israel, in Palestine. Uh, how, how best can we understand this history? Because we can't understand what's going on now without going back before the 7th of October. So Russell, I'd like to start with this claim that everything began on the 7th of October and to look a little bit at why people are saying that. I think mm. that many people in Israel, especially, of course, uniquely on the Jewish-Israeli side, believed that everything was under control. Mm. Our government gave the impression that Hamas was being surveyed, um, that in fact there were even accords, that things were going to be okay. And even more dramatically, our government was feeding us the idea that with the different normalization pacts being signed, we were in for a new age of stability, prosperity, very important word, getting richer. And of course, the big prize was going to be just tomorrow or the next day, a normalization treaty with Saudi Arabia. Of course, all of this meant that the real wound in the Holy Land was being pushed to the side, being more and more marginalized, people being encouraged to even not see it, forget that it was there. And then came the 7th of October and everything came crumbling down. Those ideas of security, those ideas of invincibility, those ideas that we had everything under control and Hamas was a little irritation that we, need, we needn't be very concerned about, that the whole Palestinian question could be relegated to the archives of history. And of course, this was a terrible shock. Mm -hmm. Now, any Palestinian that you would speak to would go back in time to say, okay, let's search for when everything began. And we could go back to the unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, which of course meant that what was relegated to some kind of no administration, no real administration, was a piece of land containing over 2 million people, 70% of whom shouldn't be there because they are refugees. And then you say, okay, but refugees, what is going on? And so you go back in history and back in history, and you could come to 1967 when the state of Israel militarily occupied uh, the rest of the Palestinian territories, or you would go back to 1947, 1948, 
the establishment of the state of Israel, a dream come true for many Jews, and yet a catastrophe for the Palestinians who were displaced, and there comes in the refugee camps in, in Gaza and many other places in the Arab world, the Palestinians again relegated to the margins of history. I tend to go back to 1917. Mm. And again, I, my apologies to anyone with British sympathies listening, but why 1917? Because Jewish national aspirations, and again, this is something new in the modern Jewish world, where Jews looked around and said, we need a home. We don't feel very much at home where we are. Jewish national aspirations were recognized by the British. And the British sent a letter, the Balfour Declaration, saying basically to the Jewish people, we will help create a Jewish national home. Of course, the indigenous people in Palestine were never consulted. And so from that moment onwards, and again, I'm not saying that Jewish national aspiration is at fault, but I would certainly say that the problem becomes a huge problem when Jewish national aspiration relies on British imperialism, the colonialism that we had hoped would come to an end in the 20th century was mobilized in order to get that Jewish homeland and an indigenous people was completely ignored. I think without really looking at those issues, we can't understand this incredible violence that has burst out from the 7th of October onwards. Jewish and also Palestinian, there is sometimes as well a lot of rhetoric about Jews and Muslims. Uh, and, I, and I think this is also in the context of that important to address. Uh, the, the war is between Jewish Israelis and Palestinian Arabs. Uh, wh what is the role of religion in this conflict? Because that's another that's another layer to to often what we hear, especially. I mean, is this a religious war? Is basically, I think, what I'm asking. So I would like to say with absolute adamancy that this mm. is not a religious war. This mm. is not a war between Jews and Muslims. This is not a war between some kind of theoretical entity called Judaism and some kind of theoretical entity called Islam. It's mm -hmm. not. It's the clash between two modern, and I would like to stress that, two modern national movements that started to evolve at the end of the 19th century and came fully into their being in the 20th century. And that is Zionism, Jewish nationalism. And again, what is so important here is that in the early days, not all Jews identified with Zionism. Mm -hmm. Okay, Zionism really became a major force in the Jewish world after the Holocaust, after mm -hmm. the Shoah. And on the other side, Palestinian nationalism. Again, if we went back 150 years, I think most people would have identified with the cities that they lived in not even with the countries that we know today that didn't exist then, or with national movements that slowly evolved from the end of the 19th century onwards. So this is not a religious war. Mm -hmm. But, and here is the big but, these mm -hmm. two national movements, Zionism and Palestinian nationalism, have fully exploited religion, religious tradition, in order to get God on their side. Mm -hmm. So of course, it's already pretty toxic when you say this land belongs to me and me alone. But if you add them, and this is what God wants, this is what's written in holy writ, then of course we have a very much more potent argument. And so I think that it is very, very important, A, to realize that at the very root of the struggle, it's not religion that is playing the major role. I'll add as a footnote there that for many centuries, Jews lived in Muslim lands, and I don't think it was the Garden of Eden. That's not for this world. It's not easy to be a minority, but mm. their life was sometimes 
in fact, often better than it was in lands where Christians were the majority and Christianity was the major player on the field. But that aside, A, it's not a religious war. I would say B, it is very important. And I think that we need to try a lot harder that religious leaders, clergy, uh, and even our major religious leaders need to help de-escalate, need to help say very clearly that, that where there is war, God is weeping, for God loves all of God's children. Mm. And stop using religion as additional motivation to engage in these horrific uh, uh, violence and bloodshed. Mm. There's also a Christian population in, in, in the Holy Land as well. What about that Christian population? Where, where are they in, in, in this? So this is, of course, a very interesting question. There has always been integral to the Palestinian people a Christian presence. Mm -hmm. And so, and many people don't even realize this, but perhaps we need to stress and underline that in the Gaza Strip, we have a Christian population. In fact, right at this moment, we have hundreds and hundreds of people taking refuge in the local Roman Catholic parish church, the parish of the Holy Family, where they are together with the priest, the parish priest, groups of women religious, hundreds and hundreds of people taking refuge. And some of you might have read that as a passing news item, the Israelis bombed in the vicinity of the Greek Orthodox parish and the people who were taking refuge there, a wall fell in on them and 18 people were killed. So again, uh, we have Christians right there in the crucible and they are suffering like all other Palestinian Arabs in Gaza. We have Palestinian Arabs who live throughout the Palestinian territories inside Israel as citizens of Israel and in the Palestinian diaspora, part and parcel of the Palestinian people. But, and this is where it gets complicated, within the state of Israel, there is also a non-Palestinian Arab Christian population. I belong to that group. We are one quarter of the Christian population in Israel. And we are Hebrew speakers who are living our day-to-day -day lives in the midst of the Jewish Israeli people. And so it's very complicated. We have a church where this divide is right in its heart. And yet perhaps here is the challenge to our own vocation and mission. And that is that as Christians, we can try our best to keep focused on the truth and the service of humanity rather than taking sides in a war that knows no mercy at all. Mm. Princess. I'm going to add because people might be wondering how many are the Christians. Mm. So we are a small group. I don't like using the word minority because we are not defined by our being Christian. We are defined by our being Jewish Israelis, part of the Jewish Israeli population, or Palestinian Arabs. And we demand not to be treated as a minority, but as equal citizens. But on the Jewish Israeli side within the state of Israel, Christians in their totality, uh, are a very small number, around just over 2%, and in Palestine, around 1%. So we're talking about a small population, but I think a population with a very prophetic vocation. Mm. And a population that certainly has also been on the mind of Pope Francis. I, I see that Pope Francis, that very parish you're talking about in Gaza, has uh, been in telephonic uh, contact with uh, the parish priest there uh, in in the in these days almost daily it seems in in this war absolutely absolutely mm. yes friends i'd like to bring you into the conversation maybe you've heard something or, or something you want to ask uh you can do that by simply putting your question in the in the chat we're not we're not going to take uh, live questions but your questions can be put in the chat and we'll also work through some of those questions. So if you have a comment or a question, feel free as well to uh, talk to us through the chat function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen uh, on uh, Zoom. 
the 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 perhaps the most difficult question from your perspective, uh, David. Um, you know, how do you understand the conflict today? How do you understand the conflict today? Well, I think that the conflict today is possible to to sum up as two peoples in one land. Mm. And of course, this makes it very, very complicated because these two peoples are not divided by specific territory or an easily drawn border. So two peoples who are today in this land, one, the Palestinian Arab people that has always been there, an indigenous people that feels itself victim of a colonial movement of people who came, at least in the beginning, predominantly from Europe and started moving in. And then, of course, linking up with the British rule, which began in 1917 and ended in 1948, supported by the British to more and more take over. And then after the Holocaust, receiving the support of the, the Western world, uh, huge portions of the world uh, was able to crush uh, any resistance to the Jewish presence there, and the Palestinians were re relegated to the margins. Now, that's how the Palestinians see it. And I think mm. that there is a lot of truth that needs to be heard there. But mm. I would say that on the other side, we are dealing with a Jewish Israeli population that sees itself as having come home. Of mm. course, this is really are very difficult in conversation because Israeli Jews do not see themselves as colonials who arrived a few years ago to run away from problems they faced in Europe. Mm. Uh, Jewish people over the centuries certainly were rooted in countries around the globe, particularly in Europe. They made themselves at home there, but they always preserved some kind of memory of a land, a, a land of their forebearers, their mothers and fathers. And then in the 19th century, that memory in the context of the development of nationalism became a dreamed of homeland. Mm. Again, many Jews see themselves as indigenous as well. And certainly over the last decades, Jews have made themselves indigenous. They speak a language which is a modern language, but a beautiful revival of an ancient language, the language of Hebrew. And they recover memories, of course, milking the biblical text for these memories, so that today, this might not have been true 100 years ago, might not have been true when the British came up with this brilliant idea of supporting a Jewish homeland in the, the 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 land of Palestine, but today we have an indigenous Jewish Israeli population. And so what we have are two peoples in one land. Now, what do we do now? These two peoples do not recognize the legitimacy of the other. Each one says, of course we do, of course we do, but we can just look at the recent decades of history and see how much blood has been spilt where we have a very powerful Israeli state. Big problem, big problem in this Israeli state is that there are, in fact, two grades of being a citizen. If you're Jewish, then you have all the rights. And if you are not Jewish, and that means almost inevitably that you're a Palestinian Arab, you live with a lot of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And then a second Part of the problem is that in 1967, when Israel was successful, victorious in that war in 67, they took over the rest of the Palestinian territories that had either been governed by Egypt or by Jordan. And so we have not only discrimination, but a military occupation in place and a state that becomes more and more ethnocentric more and more certain that the state must be Jewish, more Jewish than democratic. Mm -hmm. And so here I think that we have at least some of the issues that go into the conflict today. Mm -hmm.
there's some questions coming through, but I, I, I don't want to lose that because I also want to ask you uh, maybe a second, more difficult question. So, David, how do you foresee a solution? How do you foresee a way forward? Maybe not a solution. How do you foresee a way forward, given what you've just uh, explained? So I think that we need to believe that there is a way forward. First and foremost, I don't see very clearly what it can be right now. With the extent of the grief and the rage and the shame and the trauma that is being uh, evoked, and I would say also manipulated by our leaders, I don't see right now where we can be going. But as a person of faith, I believe that God can work. But what are the possible proposals that are offered? So the international community since 1947 has been pushing two states for two peoples. That was the partition of Palestine on the 29th of November, 1947. Now that we have these two realities and the international com community recognized those two realities, there should be two states. Again, we can go into an analysis, we won't do it, of how that decision of the international community was again passed without much consultation with the people, the Palestinian people, who were expected to make place for this Jewish state. Nonetheless, that came to nothing. And the borders were defined as a result of a first war in 1948, when Israel in fact took control of over three quarters of the territory. Then in 1967, conquered the other quarter of the territory. And so the solution of two states, which is still being vehicled, mm. might be a possibility. But the Israeli government has done everything possible, not recently, but since 1967, to make sure that there are Jewish settlements everywhere and that the land cannot be divided. I'm not saying that it won't be if there is enough international will, but the years have passed making it seem more and more unlikely. And there are few people today in the know who say that it would even be possible to divide the country, two states for two peoples. Hmm. Now, there is, of course, the possibility that it will be one state. Now, there are two forms of it being one state. It can be an ethnocentric state in which there is a privileged class and those that have to make way for the privileged class. And of course, here it smacks of a word that has been entering the discourse in the Israel-Palestine conflict for some time. It smacks of something that we know well here in South Africa, apartheid, mm. okay? An ethnocentric state means prefer pre preferring, giving preferential option to one ethnic group over the other, Jews over Arabs. Of course, there are Palestinians who dream and at least at the Hamas Charter, that is the dream, that no, the state will be completely Palestinian. Jews mm. can stay as protected people, but not as equal citizens. So yes, we have that possibility. Of course, another option, and I would say that many Christians, particularly Palestinian Christians, dream of this option and have been promoting it for a long time. And that is that there be one state, but it be democratic that it be secular, that being Jewish or Christian or Muslim does not play a role in your civil uh, public uh, role. And so, yes, there is that as well. But right now, I think that we are all focused on just trying to bring the war to an end, trying to stop the killing, trying to stop this machinery of death that has completely taken over. And of course, once we stop that, we need to look at our political leaders and ask, do they have a vision that can mm. take us from here into a future for our children, a future that will be better than the present and the past? Mm. Yes, and as we know, it's not just there, but it's all over the world that leadership it seems to me is one of the major challenges uh, that uh, we face. Um, 
anyway, that could be a shiny object, and I don't really want to get into that. But it it seems to me that is so key to this to the to the whole question of what's happening and how it's unfolding uh, at the moment. To get to some of the questions before I I want to uh, ask you something else. Uh, Someone is asking, Terence is asking, the military strategy is visible for all to see. But do you have any thought about the political strategy, which is surely informing the military strategy? That's the first question. Maybe we could deal with that because he yeah, comes to a second can, one, can, uh, which is about uh, theology. So that's the first one. So I think that the word strategy is a very interesting word because it means that there is some kind of planning, some kind of forethought and there are certainly people in the present Israeli government, rather scary people, who are doing that kind of planning. We have had expressions that are incredibly terrifying. And those expressions are of a kind of ethnic cleansing or even genocide. Again, I'm not attributing these intentions to Israel as a state and not even to the Israeli government as some kind of organism that is functioning. But there are people out there who are proposing this, okay? We have had people saying, drop a nuclear bomb on Gaza. We have had people say, push them over the Egyptian border. And so I think that here uh, we have a discourse of extremism that in the lack of any clear thinking, of where are we going? What in fact do we want? This seems to, to just rule the roost. Now, language here plays a very important role. Mm. When we say to the our leaders, uh, the, the prime minister of Israel, we say, what do you want? He says very clearly, he knows what he wants, destroy Hamas. But we're not quite sure what that means. Hamas, mm is not a person, it's not a very identifiable institution, it's an ideology. And it's an ideology that has thrived because other possible ideologies of more moderation and dialogue and, and collaboration have, have failed. Mm. So what does it mean to destroy Hamas? What we see, and this is I think what the person asking the question is referring to, what we see is destruction and devastation as Gaza is continually pummeled uh, with, with, uh, with bombs. And we see the absolute destruction everywhere, people being pulled out of rubble and people moving from place to place in a very small area, seeking some kind of safety. Now, the political strategy we don't know what it is. We know one little aspect of it is that the war shouldn't end because when the war does end, we will want to put on trial our political leadership. Mm. We will want to ask them what, what, create, what caused this incredible failure of thousands of militants able to get across what was supposed to be some kind of secure border. Why did this invincibility myth collapse? Why did this security myth collapse? And we know that at least a part of the answer to that is the type of division that this government has promoted within the Israeli Jewish population. But again, uh, the use of the word strategy is rather optimistic, assuming that there are real goals to be achieved rather than demagoguery, and the sowing of destruction and drawing the war out. And Netanyahu was in political kind of difficulty before the war started. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, absolutely correct. And now, of course, one of the horrific aspects of this war was the taking of the hostages. Hmm. And there is incredible tension uh, each day revealed between the hostages, whose, uh, sorry, the families of the hostages, whose main aim, they have a strategy. They want their, their, their loved ones back home, dealing with a government that seems to be incapable of clearly formulating what the strategy is, other than again, 
bombarding and destroying and refusing any kind of feelers for, for dialogue. The second part of that question is, uh, could you provide insights into the religious or theological mindset that underpins this Israeli, Israeli government strategy, particularly given that initial roots of Jewish nationalism seem to have been fairly secular in nature? So let's be very clear that uh, the present government led by somebody like Benjamin Netanyahu is secular. There are religious groups involved in the government and those religious groups are very diverse. Some of them have a moderating influence and some of them have a very extremist influence. So that religion plays a very, very complex and, and difficult to describe role in the Israeli political system, and especially now with the war. But, but one of the aspects that I think we need to be very careful of is the use of biblical terminology, mm. which does not necessarily mean anything religious. Remember that for a Jewish Israeli population, the Bible is also history, it's geography, it's sociology, and that Bible terminology is dragged up at every opportunity. So that when Netanyahu uh, started to define the Palestinians as Amalek, Amalek is a kind of mythological figure in the Pentateuch, God says, wipe them out. God punishes King Saul because King Saul does not wipe them out. They return at the Feast of Purim in the book of Esther to again try and wipe out the Jewish people. This biblical language together with Jewish trauma relating to the long centuries of anti-Judaism and the recent history of anti-Semitism, all form together into a kind of emotional state that makes many Israelis intransigent and determined to be victorious until victory is written all over the place. I go into my bank, it's written on the bank page. I travel on the bus, it's written on the bus. Uh, we will be victorious. Of course, war, as Pope Francis has so clearly spoken, war is defeat for everyone. Thanks, David. Felicity, it's one of the questions I wanted to ask. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, Diana is asking, any truth in the idea that Israel or Netanyahu knew of the planned attack, but wanted it to happen, so that he could basically go and wipe out the Palestinians. Okay, so I want to break that into two parts. Netanyahu knew. In other words, he knew that there was a planned attack coming. That seems now to be indisputable. Very mm. close to the beginning of the war, the Egyptians published, uh, very high up Egyptian officials, we notified Netanyahu that something was going on. And since that Egyptian announcement, there has been a lot more to show that, yes, the Israelis did have warnings that they ignored. Now, that's the second part of the question, attributing intent to the ignoring. And of course, I don't have any insider information, but it sounds to me absolutely demonic and diabolical to assume that Netanyahu let it happen. I mean, the only way I could get my mind around that is that he wouldn't have any idea of the extent to which these militants succeeded in coming through hundreds and hundreds, some are suggesting 3,000, broke through the barrier and slaughtered hundreds and hundreds of people. Again, the figure is 1,200 people. We don't know exactly how many were killed by the militants, how many were caught in the crossfire, but they killed. And now we are getting these horrific stories of rape. If Netanyahu had known that, then that can only be from the devil. I do think, though, that there is another reason why these warnings were ignored. It was, and in fact, two reasons. One, this very arrogant confidence that we have everything under control. We, we know what's going on. I mean, it would be common for Israelis to think that we not only know what every person in Gaza is doing at this present moment, we even know what they're thinking. We had such an such a, uh, exaggerated sense 
of the capacities of our military and military uh, intelligence capacities. The second thing is that, and this many Israelis are saying with extreme anger, Netanyahu seem to be more focused on staying in power, on somehow reformulating the political system of Israel, of allowing the continued growth of settlements in the West Bank, needing, of course, extra, uh, extra policing by the military police and by the soldiers, that all of these concerns meant that he pushed these warnings into the margins of his attention. And so we have these catastrophic consequences. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if we can attribute to him that absolute demonic, uh, uh, let it happen so that I can go in and destroy. But he has a lot to account for. And the Israeli mm -hmm. people are even now calling for an accounting with him and those around him. Which fits in with the fact that before this, he was fighting for his political life. And there's a certain uh, self, um, what, uh, preservation, um, selfishness. That, so he wouldn't be really looking out for... for and in uh, that, what... Russell, he fits into the category of leaders that you talked about, and we could give a whole list of them. This is the horrifying place where we are at right now uh, mm -hmm. in the leadership of nations. And yes, it seems that he is one of those, uh, one of those who is self-interested and um, yeah, hopefully yeah. there will be an accounting. You've, you've, you've answered, you, you've touched on this already. Lauren's asking, given the discrimination against Arabs in the Israeli state, how much truth would you say there is in claiming that Israel is an apartheid state? So this is of course very explosive. Israelis get very upset. Uh, about this claim, but of course the human rights organizations have done extensive research on this to show two things. Again, it goes back to two different realities that both make up our present Israeli reality. The first reality is the reality of the occupation, which has mm -hmm. gone on since 1967, the control of a Palestinian population of over 5 million people, who do not have freedom, who do not have the right to express themselves, to move around freely. That is in the territories occupied by Israel. And then looking into the state of Israel, what is internationally recognized as a legitimate state, the Israel that was boarded in 1949 with the armistice agreement that brought that first war, 1948-49 war to an end, within there, Arabs have the vote, they participate in the political system. But where does the inequality come to the fore? And that is, of course, in the socioeconomic sphere, where so much is reserved for the Jewish population. And so, yes, there are today many who will claim that Israel is an apartheid state, made up, of course, of those two complex different realities. The one is uh, the call for the end of occupation so that the Palestinians in the occupied territories can create a state alongside Israel and be free. And the other, which is a very strong call, is that within the state of Israel, the legislation that is ethnocentric be withdrawn and people can be equal citizens of a state that is Israeli rather than in any particularly uh, a discriminatory way Jewish. Lauren's asking, David, from a, border, uh, from a broader geopolitical perspective, it's apparent that Russia, she says, along with China, has provoked or sponsored this recent violence via Iran with the intent of sowing dissent among populations in the West, in which they are seemingly succeeding. Uh, are the parties on the ground aware of this manipulation, or is it regarded as strictly local conflict? I think that we all know within our local situation that we have been for many, many decades since the beginning, we have been manipulated by world powers. This goes back to the state of Israel being established during the Cold War. And already then uh, uh, there being this tension between the bloc led by the United States and the bloc led by the uh, Soviet Union. I think that the problem is not 
that they are looking for, they are looking to manipulate us. The problem is the real issue right there at the heart of the conflict. If we don't want to be manipulated, if we want to get out of these power games of the great powers, whether it's Russia or China, or having Iran being involved in our affairs, or the United States being involved in our affairs, I think that we really have to come to an understanding of what the conflict is and how best to come to a resolution, if not a resolution, how we can live together uh, in a better way with the ongoing contradictions and sufferings that this uh, conflict has, has provoked. Mm. Uh, Bishop Robert is asking, how true is the news that the discovery of natural gas and oil in areas under the Gaza Strip is the reason why Netanyahu wants to drive the Palestinians out of Gaza? I would again say that these are theories uh, that border a little bit on conspiracy theories. Uh, mm. So I don't want to say absolutely not, because tomorrow maybe it'll be announced. But again, what is motivating this conflict is the, the historic struggle between these two peoples. And I think that we really need to look at that and focus on that. Again, mm. if there are these wonderful resources under Gaza, how wonderful it would be uh, if we could reach a state where these two people are living together and all of these natural resources can be exploited. The next question, I think, is a very important one, David, from Eva. She's asking, being present yourself in Israel at, the, at, at that time, you know, I mean, you've been back for two weeks, so you were there for, for a month of the war. Do you find that the media have reported or not reported truthfully the events that have taken place? There are many accounts I have read, she says, of horrific sexual acts committed against Israeli women and girls in the attack, which would, of course, elicit a response of high emotions and retaliation. Yeah, I think that is such an important question for all of us because we, we listen to the media and we think, okay, this must be what's really happening. What is your experience on the ground? So I said earlier, the first victim of war is truth. Mm. And the media is not helping us retain a sense of truth. Of course, the media has a very, very difficult job. Now, I'll only say what I do personally in order to try and get my mind around what is happening. Mm. Hearing the absolutely horrific accounts of what went on on the 7th of October, killing and rape and maiming and destruction, listening to that, and then listening closely to the horrific accounts of what has gone on since the 7th of October, inside the Gaza Strip, and not only inside the Gaza Strip, let's be aware that there is a very, very small-scale war, but a war going on also in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And, of course, the attempt to control public opinion inside Israel, which means a lot of policing. So what do I do in order to try and get my mind around this? I try to read a number of sources never relying on one. So in the morning, I tend to read four different sources, two in Hebrew, one in Arabic, and then in English, to try and get some kind of impression. Sometimes it feels like I'm reading about two different worlds that, that don't even coincide. They coincide because the names of the places are the same and the names of the people are the same, but the, the, the narratives are so different. So again, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to know what is really going on. And again, I don't want to point a fast a finger at journalists because journalists can't be everywhere at once. So they're describing, a journalist in Gaza is describing the horror that he sees. Whereas a journalist in Israel who is constantly being reminded of what happened on the 7th of October is sharing that with us. But we as observers from the outside have really the duty, if we want to try and understand, and certainly if we want to express an opinion, to try and discern where does the truth lie. Mm -hmm. And I think that here, there are certain things that we can do. 
And if you permit me, Russell, I'd like to say some things of what each one of us can do within this situation if we are committed to working together to bring something better. I don't even want to use the word justice, peace and equality, but those are definitely our goals. So I would say first, and I say this to Eva, who's a woman of prayer, we need to pray. We need to pray so that God reveals in us what are our prejudices, what are our partialities, and we all have them absolutely clearly, okay? Some of us are for the Israelis and some of us are for the Arabs, but we want to really know who we are coming to the situation. The second is to try and learn, and again, that means a lot of listening. And as I said before, personally, well, I'm more involved than probably most people here, but I try to read at least four newspapers every day that are following this from different points of view. Thirdly, so that I can speak out. And this comes to the search for words, words that build, words that sow justice, peace, equality, pardon, words that open up the horizon. We tend to use words that build walls. And again, when we're emotional and when we are manipulated by people telling us certain aspects of the truth rather than the whole truth, uh, words will flow out of us. I'd say we must be very careful. We must be very careful and watch our words. Russell, with your permission, I went back mm. to get the exact text there is a text that I pray with every day. I didn't, I don't go back and read it word for word, but it was a very, very formative moment for me. And that is after Pope Francis visited the Holy Land, he shocked all of us. I was first shocked because I had in fact made sure that all his speeches were translated. And so when he came to the land, I knew what he was gonna say. And then suddenly this Pope drives me nuts. He surprised us. And he said something that wasn't on the paper. And he said, I am inviting the Israeli president and the Palestinian president to come and pray in the Vatican. I want them to come. And as part of his invocation on that occasion, surrounded by the Israeli president, Shimon Peres, the Palestinian president, Abu Mazen, he said the following words, and I go back to these words always. For me, they are really an anchor in my attempt to be some kind of presence that is healing uh, in the situation. He said, we know and we believe that we need the help of God. We do not renounce our responsibilities, but we do call upon God in an act of supreme responsibility before our consciences and before our peoples. We have heard a summons and we must respond. It is the summons to break the spiral of hatred and violence and to break it by one word alone, the word brother, sister. But to be able to utter this word, we have to lift our eyes to heaven and acknowledge one another as children of one father. For me, in these times, and so unfortunately we live them over and over again, when I think of our parent God, the one who is really the parent of all, of Israeli and Palestinian, of Jew, Muslim and Christian, my image is of a God who is weeping, weeping over what we have done. Thank you, uh, David. That's that's very powerful. I see Gersh is also uh, linking back almost to the last question about propaganda, the role of propaganda. How do we elevate truth in this time of propaganda, and how does that take center stage amidst uh, amidst um, I'm getting tongue tied amidst divisive uh, propaganda? I, I think you've you've sort of given uh, an, an, an so answer Russell, to I would that, say but that we don't right now have the capacity to know what mm. is the truth when it comes to facts, okay? What exactly happened on the 7th of October? We know there was killing and rape and maiming and burning and horrific things. We know 
that what Gaza has experienced since the 7th of October till now is absolutely horrific. But the details that are being mm. communicated, well, we don't know how to what extent every detail is verifiable. But we do know certain things that are truth. Mm. Every single human being is created in the image and likeness of God. Every single human being is equal in God's eyes. These are truths that we know that should be at the very, very heart of any words we speak about what is happening in Israel and Palestine today. And I think that this is a Christian mission and vocation to proclaim this loud and clear. So, yeah, truth in the details, we'll find out. We mm. inevitably do, as people do their research, who bombed this, when and why, okay? Uh, how many children have been maimed and, and, and killed on either side? What exactly, this is the big polemic now, how did the Palestinians treat the Israeli hostages? Huge polemic, depending on which newspaper you read, you get just such different stories, okay? And again, it's like you're reading about two different worlds. And how are the Palestinian prisoners being treated in Israeli prisons? We've recently learned that in the last month, six of them have died in Israeli prisons, two of them having been uh, tied up. So again, the truth will come out, I'm sure. But right now, we know enough of the truth so that it can orient our words, our prayers, and how we think about what's going on in Israel, Palestine today. We, our time is getting short. There's one or two other questions which I think are quite important to get to. One thing just to say about propaganda and truth as well. I've noticed like so many people even in the in the circle that I have, you know, the stuff we forward on social media, I think it's very important that we think before we just push forward uh, because that in itself when we are spreading things that we don't know are true is part of the propaganda machine, you know, even from where, from where we are. Um, there's a question about uh, were journalists intentionally attacked by Israeli soldiers? I'm not sure that they were. I think this is just what happens in war. There are reports of Christian pilgrims being ill-treated before the October the 7th. Is that true, uh, David? Maybe just a short answer to that. Yeah, okay, that's a whole different kettle of fish, uh, the treatment of Christians because of a certain teaching of contempt for Christians in Jewish-Israeli circles, us uh, spitting on people, uh, defacing churches and holy places, attacking them. Let's remember that that is a whole different discussion that would then need to do the history of where does that attitude towards Christians come from. So again, I'm not sure that that's for tonight. But yes, it is one of the things that we have to deal with as Christians living in the land. And sometimes it's... Yes? Sorry. I just noticed uh, that somebody put in a little quotation from Henry Nowen. Uh, and could, could you read it? Because I think that this is also something very important and very beautiful to remind ourselves of. Do you see it there? Yes. Henry Nowen says in a, in a state war... Defense is mutual annihilation. And I think that that really we also should meditate upon because we speak so flippantly about the right to self-defense. But the right to self-defense inevitably, inevitably descends into the type of annihilation that we are witnessing. So I think that that too, our use of terms like just war and the right to self-defense, we need to use only when we've really reflected on what does that mean in its practicalities? What are we seeing about just war and self-defense in the conflict as it unfolds in Israel-Palestine right now? Thank you, uh, David. We're on time. Uh, someone's asking if we're going to upload this video. Yes, this video will be uploaded uh, probably, hopefully, by midday tomorrow. It will be on the YouTube channel of the Jesuit Institute. So feel free to go along and to find it there, to share it if you think this discussion has been helpful. Um, there is a question as well about, and I guess this is a South African problem in a way with languages, which med English media sources do you recommend? I don't know if you want to say something about that, David, because I think that is quite important. 
So I think that again, you'd need to look at a number, a number of different ones. There is, <laughs> there are two, there are in fact three uh, Israeli English language newspapers, dailies, Haaretz, which is a very liberal, critical uh, newspaper, the Times of Jerusalem, which is kind of moderate, trying to find a, a balanced language. We don't always want balance. And then there is the Jerusalem Post that tends to be a little bit more right wing. Uh, in the On the Arab side, so there are a number of important Arabic uh, media in English. I think that we all know one of the most important is Al Jazeera out of Qatar. Uh, and again, giving very important coverage, not always unbiased, but very important, very thought provoking. I never miss looking up Al Jazeera every day a few times. And then of course, there is the international press with which you would be familiar. There is a very critical, um, um, how do you say, website where uh, Jewish Israelis and Palestinian Arabs contribute their insights into what's going on. And I think it's worthwhile looking at. It's kind of in the margins. It's not mainstream press, but I inevitably look there in order to be provoked, in order to think more. And it's simply called 972. 972 is the dialing code for the State of Israel. Very, very interesting coverage, editorial coverage rather than uh, news like you would find in the other four sources that I mentioned. David, thank you very much. It's uh, one minute past eight. We said we would go for one hour. I uh, I I know that this is something that is very obviously close to your heart because uh, Israel is your home. Uh, so thank you for sharing this with us. And I see there's a comment from Hugh O'Connor saying, "In all this story of suffering, people are suffering. We ought not to, uh, we ought not to forget that." Uh, so thank you uh, for sharing. You know, just this this terrible thing that we're living with. I'd also like to end this evening by maybe just saying, if we could just spend one moment together before you sign off. And let's just remember people who are suffering in war all over the world. We know there's this terrible conflict in Gaza. We know Ukraine on our own continent here in northern Mozambique, in uh, Ethiopia, in Sudan. Think of the conflict in Myanmar, where people every single day, young children only know bloodshed and violence. Let's just take a moment uh, to remember those people and to uh, pray for them. We commend all who have died in violence throughout the world to our merciful God who loves every human being made in his image and likeness. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, spending time with us this evening. It's been great to have you. As I said, this video will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. I wish you all a very blessed uh, Advent. Let's uh, keep in mind, let's pray for those, especially in the Holy Land, who won't be able to uh, celebrate uh, Christmas this year. But I also wish you and all your families a very uh, blessed uh, Christmas. So may God bless you all. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.